Good evening, everyone. My name is Kate Hutton. I'm with the City of Seattle Office of Emergency Management, and tonight we're going to be holding the Transportation Restoration um, Earthquake Response Webinar for the City of Seattle. So bear with us for a bit while a few more people join, um, and then we'll get started. If you do want to use captions and subtitles, uh, that is available to you. I uh, use the instructions on your screen right now to do that. Um, you would just use the CC button in the corner and then select the language you'd prefer. There are English subtitles as well as a few other languages. So if you do want other language resources, they are available to you. And again, we'll get started very soon. All right, everyone, we'll go ahead and get started. Again, my name is Kate Hutton. I'm with the City of Seattle's Office of Emergency Management. I'm the Communications Coordinator. Um, we will be using uh, Teams Live, which does have live captions and subtitle options. You can see on the screen the instructions on turning those on. Um, we will be sending out these slides and this, a recording of this presentation after the presentation. So if you do want to share that or review it, that will be available. If you register for this event, we'll be able to share that with you. Um, I'm, my name is Kate Hutton. I'm with the, the Office of Emergency Management Communications Coordinator, and I handle um, our public information and things like that. Um, I do have a few slides as introduction today to kind of introduce the first um, kind of concept of earthquakes and all that. So, Patty, if you could give me my first slide, please. So there are three main types of earthquakes in Seattle. The first are crustal or shallow earthquakes, and those are the kind of earthquakes that will come from our Seattle fault. Um, that runs right along I-90, and um, those are gonna be pretty destructive. They're relatively shallow quakes. And they're gonna cause a lot of damage. Uh, another type of earthquake that you might be familiar with is a subduction zone quake. And uh, that's the Cascadia quake. So that's the one that's gonna be off our coast and a, um, probably cause a tsunami in all likelihood. Um, so that's the second kind. And then there's also intraplate quakes, which are very deep. They don't tend to have a ton of damage on the surface. We saw that with the Nisqually quake. Um, next slide, please. Kate, I advanced the next slide. Are you not able to see it? Thank you. No, I can see it now. Thank you. Um, so there are many different impacts that we could see from an earthquake. So we need to be aware of those, right? Roads and bridges might be damaged, which is the primary thing we're going to expect um, to see and talk about in this presentation. But we also might see things like stores running out of food, utilities being damaged, gas stations and ATMs might not work. Um, there might be also impacts to hospital infrastructure and communications infrastructure, and first responders might not be able to get to you right away. On the next slide, please. So the impacts we can expect from those are gonna be a lot of damages to buildings. We can also expect, unfortunately, multiple deaths, many deaths and injuries. Um, lots of people will be in need of shelter and there could be widespread fires due to gas leaks and ignitions. Um, heavy transportation and infrastructure damage is also expected. And that's again what we're going to be talking about today, transportation restoration. And we can expect significant damages into the billions. Uh, the next slide, please. And I apologize for the slight delay. It looks like there's a little bit of a delay on the slide, so just bear with us on this one. Okay. 
here we go. So um, after an earthquake, we're going to face something called the isolation phase. A catastrophic earthquake is going to leave our city isolated just by nature of our geography and the infrastructure impacts we are going to face. And so um, we won't be the only jurisdiction impacted by a major quake. All of our surrounding cities, many surrounding counties, and if it's a large enough earthquake, the entire state, if not the West Coast, would be significantly impacted by an earthquake. And so we'll be pretty isolated, but again, both in terms of our geography and available resources. And that's why it's so important for us to restore transportation, which Patty's going to talk about a bit more um, as we go on. If we can get the next slide, Patty. So there are a few different relevant plans and documents. If you go to our website, that's going to be emergency.seattle.gov. Um, these kind of outline the broader city plans. Again, we'll talk about transportation restoration specifically today, but these handle, um, you know, just the, the general response framework that we've gone on in the previous videos. If you do want to see more about things like utility restoration or uh, fire and medical response, we did have previous webinars on those and they're available on our YouTube channel um, and you can watch those. And with that, I will turn it over to Patty Quirk, who's with our Department of Transportation. Um, Patty, go ahead and take it away. Patty, I think you're muted. Uh, yes, sorry. I, I, we're still having a little technical issues. I have to restart just my portion. I'm doing that right now. OK, it looks like your slides are up. But you still can't hear you, Patty. Sorry about that. Patty, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now, Kate? I can. I'm sorry about that. Um, I had recorded. Yes, on Tuesday, and it, it's trying to play my recording instead of live with you all. Um, <clears throat> as Kate said, my name is Patty Quirk. I'm with the Seattle Department of Transportation. I've been with SDOT almost 20 years, and I am our Homeland Security and Emergency Management Specialist. And if you see me kind of looking like I'm not looking at you all, uh, I just have two screens going at the same time. And so I apologize for not being able to look at people a little more closely. I also have Kit Liu joining us tonight, and Kit is one of SDOT's bridge engineers. So when we get to the Q&A questions portion of the evening, Kit will be able to answer more of the technical questions. And then also Kayla Grayson, who is my counterpart at the Washington State Department of Transportation, and she will be discussing WASDOT's preparedness. A little bit about SDOT and, and who we are and how we approach not only our daily work, but also any preparations and response efforts that we do. We believe that Seattle is and should be a thriving and equitable city, command, command, pardon me, powered by dependable, safe, reliable, and I think also affordable transportation. And we believe it's our mission to deliver a system that provides that safe and affordable transportation system that allows you to do things like attend community meetings or visit your family or shop or go to school or, or go to work when we all eventually end up back in our offices. To do all of these things that we need to do and deliver on our, our mission and value, we have six, pardon me, our mission and our vision, we have six core values, equity, safety, mobility, sustainability, livability, and excellence. And all of those come into play when we're talking about earthquake preparedness and response. We want to be equitable in, in how we plan and respond, knowing that the people that are least able to sustain anything crisis-wise related to an earthquake or, or any disaster really are often the most impacted. So we want to keep them in mind. Safety, obviously, the safety of you, the public, and also of our staff and other city workers. 
mobility. Kate showed you a, a snapshot of some of the damage or it's, I mean, it's big. And so mobility is a huge issue. The sooner that we restore mobility, that means that we will have a sustainable economy again and a community life and livability. Of course, if all of those things are broken, it's not a very livable situation. And then lastly, excellence. And I would say it's not just excellence on what you expect from us to deliver, but also the excellence that we expect of ourselves and each other. So our topics tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about SDOT and our portfolio to give you an idea of all of the things that we manage and are responsible for. Then we're going to talk about response readiness, prioritization, operations and damage assessment, personal preparedness in SDOT, then I'm going to trans, uh, pardon me, transition to Kayla Grayson from WashDOT. And then lastly, we will have time for you to ask questions. Some facts about SDOT. We have 950 dedicated staff, although I think we have more than that now. We are organized into 13 divisions. We are responsible for 3,952 lane miles, two streetcar lines, 124 bridges, four of those that are movable. You can see that photo on the right is actually a routine underwater inspection from Kitts Group. We have 502 public stairways, 613 retaining walls, 238 areaways. And if you are unfamiliar with what an areaway is, it is a legacy from the Great Seattle Fire where the city was rebuilt one level up so that the second story became the first story. And so now we have these voids under the sidewalk in our historic areas like Pioneer Square. If you think about them, they're like almost a concrete box and the top of the box holds up the sidewalk and part of the street. The outside box edge also holds up the street and then the inside helps support the building. So these tend to be with unreinforced concrete masonry buildings that are very susceptible in an earthquake. So those would certainly have a big impact in our transportation network, probably causing voids where this, the street and sidewalk would collapse. We have 2,100 sidewalks and pathways, and then 1,125 traffic signals and 286 traffic cameras. So if you are spending your time with us tonight, you are probably interested in transportation and are aware that we have these live traffic cameras that are available on our website. They're available to the public, but we also use them and so do our partners like Kayla to figure out what, what is going on. And those make up our intelligent transportation system. So some of the seismic impacts that, that uh, we're expecting, and it not, it's not just us, if you've attended any of these other sessions all across the city, we expect significant impacts to our roadway structures that we just talked about on the previous slide, bridges, staircases, retaining walls, and areaways. We expect huge impacts to our street network, whether it's a areaway that I described collapsing or just general seismic movement. We know that there will be impacts to our intelligent transportation system that I just spoke about. The piece of that that it wasn't listed on the previous slide is our transportation operations center. And that is the center that monitors all of the traffics all of the time and has live response abilities, capabilities, whether to dispatch people or bring in signal engineers or transportation engineers to create traffic rerouting. And lastly, we know that there is going to be access problems to our, our critical infrastructure partners like Kayla from WashDOT, but also energy. And when I talk about energy, if you're thinking about electricity, which we know will be impacted, the city has a percentage of their fleet is electric, and so that will be a problem. We will not be able to charge our vehicles. And then the ones that are fuel dependent, we will have problems getting fuel so that we are able to go out and do all the things that we need to do. In addition, we know that there will be limited or unavailable telecommunications as well. So Kate talked a little bit about some of the damage to expect and the period of isolation. This is actually a slide that I got from the Washington State Department of Emergency Management as we are planning for a big uh, national level earthquake drill next year. I just want to say though that the impacts that we are looking at, all of the angry red dots and lines, they're beyond Seattle. This, these are these are statistics that relate to the whole Cascadia subduction zone. Why that is important is these are our neighbors who would normally help us 
when um, there is a big event, but they won't be able to because they will be impacted as well. And this is again the period of isolation that Kate referred to. So we are looking at 16,000 miles of highway damage, 7,000 bridges, 6,000 miles of rail, 100 rail bridges, 100 airports, and 700 port facilities. And this doesn't include things that will be impacted such as police precincts, community centers, hospitals, and fire stations as well. So it's a pretty big thing to get, get your head around, but it's really important when we are educating the public about preparedness and what we, we are planning on and what we expect from the public as well. So what is SDOT doing? How are we preparing ourselves to respond? So we use the incident command system. And if you've been on any of the other uh, briefings, you will have heard that from all of the other agency partners. That is a national system that FEMA instigated, or pardon me, instituted, and that came out of lessons learned from Katrina. But really what it does, it allows us to all have a common language and also an organizational structure. So in the event of something catastrophic like an earthquake, we are able to quickly pivot and respond. SDOT will assign an incident commander who will lead our incident management team. So we have pre-identified incident commanders, but they, they will manage SDOT's response. We will activate our Department Operations Center where our incident management team will be, and they will serve as a consolidation point for all of the damage assessments and response efforts that SDOT is leading. And the doc is filled with subject matter experts who are very versed and well-trained in emergencies. And lastly, our IMT and our Department Operations Center will serve as a liaison between the city's emergency operations center. This picture up on the right corner is actually that transportation operations center that I mentioned that is staffed 24 seven. And you can see some of our traffic cameras and one of our engineers in the background. How we respond, we use a decentralized response approach. It's the same approach that we use in winter weather where we run operations from both our West Seattle yard, from downtown at Charles Street, which is in the International District, and also up north at Heller Lake. So what that gives us as far as response readiness is in the event that communications are not available, staff know to report to one of those locations depending on where you live and can go ahead and start our operational response and not need to be told what to do. We saw all of those broken things and all of the things that SDOT is going to be responsible for. So part of our planning is knowing that we are going to need outside resources to come in and help us after that period of isolation ends. And we also know that those of us who live and work here are, are the best experts and not um, outside people that come in to help. So using that incident command system, we will integrate outside help and establish an arterial repair group a bridge repair group, a debris removal group, and then a intelligent transportation system repair group. And again, that's our transportation operations center, our signals and our traffic cameras. Uh, lastly, on this slide, we use Alert Seattle. And if you haven't signed up for Alert Seattle, I highly suggest that you do. It's the fastest way to get information on impacts, not just in an earthquake, but it could be impacts related to a sporting event or something of those along those lines. Um, it's also a great tool. We use it internally to contact our staff and we are able to quickly communicate as well. Patty, I'm going to jump in really quickly. Um, it looks like folks, the Q&A isn't working. So if you do have any questions, you can email those to oem at seattle.gov and I will either read those off at the end or get those answered via email. Sorry about that. Go ahead, Patty. Thanks, Kate. So, so Kate had mentioned some plans earlier in her introduction to the evening, and so this is a little bit more on SDOT's piece of those plans and then our own internal plans. So we have a guide for our incident management team. We use it for winter weather. You, you can see the brochure on the right. Uh, we use it for things like closing a major bridge, like the West Seattle Bridge, or responding to COVID. We also have a transportation annex emergency support function one, which fits into the city's earthquake annex. You will hear Kayla talk about this as well. Why I have transportation in italics there is in an emergency where we are activated, 
transportation grows beyond those things that I that I showed you that SDOT is responsible for, and SDOT now becomes the conduit for air, for water, for ferries, for freight, for, for rail, for any of those things so that we can have a consolidated response. We um, have an earthquake response plan, which we we're talking about tonight, damage assessment plan. Every year we revise our winter weather readiness and response plan, and that is available online. And I think most important on this slide is our pandemic response plan. Certainly before COVID, uh, we like other people didn't anticipate that we would ever have a year and a half of a pandemic to live through. And so our pandemic response plan was super skinny. But what we learned through COVID is having to create staffing plans, looking at only 25% of our staff available or 50% and figuring out how it is that we are still going to deliver on all of those things that we need to do. The great thing is, is we can still use that same staffing plan and that work that we did for the pandemic in an earthquake situation like we are talking about tonight, knowing that we will probably have limited staffing resources. So we've done the, the work on that and figured out how we can go ahead and, and deliver the things we need to do. So I would say that is probably one of the best things that has come out of the pandemic from city planning purposes. Our priorities, and again, if you've attended any of these other sessions, are similar or the same for any responding agency, life safety and public health. And I would also say the safety of our employees that are working, incident stabilization, environmental and property restoration, and public trust. And by public trust, what that means is that we want to be transparent in how we communicate. We want to communicate as quickly as we can, but we want to communicate accurately. So there might be a delay as we are making sure what we were telling the public is accurate. And then um, also listen and from, from the public and take in information and be able to report out on that as well. And we use these priorities to prepare to and also to respond to incidents. Damage assessment, you will see uh, the picture there of our incident response vehicle. If you haven't seen those out on the street, um, people keep an eye out for them. They are out there 24 seven. I think we are one of the only cities that actually has an incident response crew, just like this picture. It's it's something usually you'll see on the highway. Uh, Caleb Grayson has them, WashDOT has them, but we also have them as well. So once that initial earthquake hits, what's going to happen citywide is a rapid operational response, also called a preliminary damage assessment. Those are windshield surveys that police and fire will do and other departments like City Light and Public Utilities. They have a plan. They have things that they're automatically going to go out and look at. The importance of that is we are not staffed the same. So while we do run 24 seven operations, at night and on the weekends, unless we know that there is a need for extra staff, we're pretty light. So if an earthquake happened on a holiday or a weekend, it would take us a little extra time to ramp up. And we would look to our sister agencies who have already started their windshield surveys to get some information. We do though have crews deployed, as I mentioned, our SDOT response team up there. We would use our traffic cameras if they were available and also social media. The cool thing about social media is in the last probably five, six years, every disaster, what you will see is some someone cleverer than myself will come up with an aggregate who looks at multiple social media channels. So what that would look like is one person might say and report, hey, uh, I, I think the West Seattle Bridge is down. That's 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 helpful, but that's not really something for us to act upon. But with an aggregate, you might see five, six, seven people saying the same thing and also posting pictures. Then it becomes a um, greater source of information for us and we are able to act upon it a little bit better. So can't underestimate the value of social media. Our damage assessment plan. So we have bridge damage, damage assessors who will dispatch on pre-assigned routes. That is a uh, group lives within kits division and then we also have an arterial damage assessment who also will those are our street use inspectors and they have predetermined routes and will go ahead and start driving as soon as they get in and in case those communications are down they know exactly what they need to do i think the last bullet on this uh slide is that um 
because we have such a, a big portfolio and nothing happens if the transportation network is not available, we consider every single employee in SDOT to be mission essential. And what that means is every employee is told and we train and practice that in the event uh, that, that they are needed, we can reassign them and move them into different positions. This is also something that we were able to practice for the first time with, with COVID as we needed to respond to different things and, sh and shift resources. A little bit more about our bridge inspections. So our engineers automatically within an hour of a 5.7 or greater magnitude within 50 miles of the city will go ahead and self-deploy and start those inspections. Sometimes just to practice, they will do it if there's a earthquake that's, that's um, lower than that 5.7 because it's a good opportunity to go ahead and, and practice. Within four hours of that initial deployment, we expect that they will start reporting those damage assessments into that emergency support function that I talked about for transportation liaison, and that is until SDOT's internal incident management team can fully stand up and start consolidating damage assessments. You can't start to figure out what you need to fix if you don't know what's broken, so that damage assessment piece is really important. And then, of course, if there's an aftershock, we have to start the damage assessment process again. Damage assessment for arterials, it's pretty similar, although there's a little more of a delay in our target time of starting. It's within four hours. That really depends on time of day and night. I mentioned that unlike fire and police and the utilities, we staff a little bit differently. So if we have an earthquake on a weekend, a holiday or at night, it's going to take us more time to get folks in, especially if they have issues um, with with transportation trying to get in. So within four hours, that's our target to go ahead and have our arterial inspection start. That doesn't mean that we won't be collecting information from other agencies. We will highly depend on them and also social media. And then, as I mentioned, because we think that we believe that all of our staff are mission essential, we will shift technical staff from other divisions to go ahead and support these inspections. And that last bullet, as I mentioned, you can't know what to fix unless you know it's broken. And so our damage reports are significant in not only our restoration plan, but working towards things like a presidential disaster declaration. What are our operational priorities besides doing those inspections that I just mentioned? Safety of employees and our traveling public, those are utmost important. Safety is always first. And then Seattle Fire Department, if you didn't hear their presentation, they are the lead agency in a fire response. So we will do whatever we need to do to support their response efforts. And then we're gonna look at restoring our lifelines. Those are lifelines that ensure first responders can have ingress and egress to the places that they need to go, access to medical facilities, and once shelters and community points of distribution are set up, that people can actually access those, and then reconnecting to the county and the state transportation network. Kate again talked about that period of isolation, so as soon as we can reconnect outside the city limits, the sooner we can not only get supplies in, move out injured, and people who would have lost um, their housing and also bring in those outside resources for us. And then utilities, if you if you aren't aware of how uh, the right of way is or what the right of way is, that is all of the um, property that SDOT manages on behalf of the citizens of Seattle and utilities are either on, under, or over our right-of-way. So we want to make sure when we are prioritizing how we're restoring the right-of-way that we are talking closely with our telecommunications partners, SPU and City Light, so that if they have a priority to restore something, that we are working with them to repair the right-of-way so that they can get those utilities back up and running. And then lastly, something that might not come to mind with earthquakes, but landslides. Landslides are a very common consequence of earthquakes, and we are already a landslide prone city. So we still have to focus on landslide mitigation and then response. We also coordinate with our partners. Again, Washtard is here tonight. We coordinate on a regular basis, whether it's winter weather response, um, 
and certainly an event like an earthquake, we would be closely coordinating. So we will provide that critical link between not only SDOT's incident management team, but I mentioned our all of our transportation partners, whether it's freight or the airport or the ferries that WashDOT manages. And then we are also responsible to work closely with regulatory agencies to ensure that our plans and our responses comply with best practices and laws enforced by these agencies. So a good example of this is the Coast Guard and we work with them regularly. They are the regulatory agency on any of the waterways. And so our movable bridges cover waterways. Uh, I'm gonna refer again to the West Seattle Bridge. So when we looked at adding a lot of extra traffic to the lower bridge, that's the Spokane Street Bridge, that is a movable bridge over a waterway. And we had to work closely with the Coast Guard to make sure that if that bridge had to close, meaning it couldn't be open for maritime traffic, that we were following all of the rules and obligations that we needed to. Um, just a trivia point here, the maritime traffic actually has precedence. It, it has the right of way over vehicle traffic that's surface side. Internally, what do we do as a department to make sure that our staff is prepared? Weekly, we send out um, an all staff preparedness email that talks about not only personal preparedness, but provides the latest information on earthquakes or snow response or landslides or whatever season that we are in. We also meet monthly with our incident management team to walk through scenarios, to cover lessons learned from previous activations, and to make sure that we are ready to respond to the next event that occurs. We do earthquake drills. Our next one is actually planned for October. Um, if you're not aware, October is the state's great shakeout, and so we will be participating, I believe it's the 21st this year, and doing a department-wide exercise, um, including setting up an alternative transportation operations center, which we've not done before. And again, that's where all of our traffic cameras are, so that'll be a good opportunity to practice that. And then we also participate in agency drills with our partner agencies to make sure that we can tie in and work closely together. And we participate in national exercises. I mentioned that Cascadia exercise coming up next year. Saw that slide, it had a lot of red angry things on it. That is uh, something that we will participate in. 2016, the Cascadia exercise was the bi biggest national exercise in the history of this country. So that was pretty cool. And we participate in that and take lessons learned and then adapt to what we've learned so that we are better prepared. Personal preparedness, Kate talked about that isolation period. I cannot emphasize that enough. We know absolutely that services are gonna be interrupted, telecommunications, food, water, all of those things that we depend on. So really stressing that you have that need to have a two day or pardon me, a two week kit. And I would say, don't forget your pets, your fur babies. I was in a presentation and I thought, wow, I hadn't really thought about that several years ago. So I always keep an unopened bag of dog food in my garage. So when I wait to the last minute and it's empty and I'm running to the grocery store, if there's an earthquake, I don't have to worry about them. And lastly, I really encourage you to stay informed. This isn't just for earthquakes, this is for daily information on our traffic and how SDOT is managing and real-time information. So you can follow us on Twitter, real-time traffic. You can get SDOT up updates. And then I encourage you to also look at our uh, blog post and our websites as well. And with that, I am going to turn over the presentation to Kayla Grayson, my counterpart in the Washington State Department of Transportation. All right, everybody, just bear with you for one second while we get Kayla queued up here. Okay, there we go. Take it away, Kayla. All right, can you hear me? I can hear you, but Patty, we lost the slides. Oh, how's this? There we go. Okay, perfect. 
Okay, so hi, I'm Kayla Grayson. I am the emergency manager for Washington State Department of Transportation Northwest region, which includes the city of Seattle. Uh, thanks for inviting me to participate today. I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about Washington State Department of Transportation response um, to an earthquake and how we would work to restore our um, state system. Okay, so um, Washington State Department of Transportation acts as the lead agency for emergency support function one, which Patty mentioned before. Um, this is down at Camp Murray. This is how the state um, organizes between locals and state agencies, nonprofit organizations to ensure that everybody works in a coordinated effort um, in a response um, aspect. So ESF one emergency support function one is the transportation emergency support function. Washa acts as the lead agency and all transportation then falls into that structure. So this includes any sort of transportation, roadways, marine highways, railways, aircraft, etc. Um, so Washington State Ferries also bunches into um, this transportation structure. The way that it tends to work is a city reports to a county, a county reports to the state, um, and then the state works to coordinate all of our resources so we can send resources where they're needed the most. Um, we also then deploy some representatives, agency representatives, to local emergency operations centers in major metropolitan areas such as the city of Seattle. Um, so we would likely send a representative, if we are able to get there, to the city of Seattle um, Emergency Operations Center and ensure that we have a direct line of communication um, within our EOCs. And then to just cover WashDOT's response priorities, Patty mentions that our response priorities are going to be very similar. We all um, put life safety first. The safety of the traveling public and the safety of our employees are always going to be our number one priority. Um, after that, we're gonna start our initial damage assessments. That begins with um, level one inspections in bridges and tunnels. And it's important to note when we talk about bridges, Washot builds our bridges to a life safety standard. The goal is to ensure that the bridge does not fall down. It doesn't mean though that the bridge is going to be usable for weeks or even months after an earthquake. Sometimes it will take a long period of time for us to restore the damage that has been caused to the infrastructure. Um, however, I did want to mention that in the city of Seattle, we do have multiple structures that are built to a quote unquote essential standard. That means it should withstand a major earthquake, something similar to Cascadia. Um, those pieces of infrastructure are the SR520 floating bridge and the SR99 Alaskan Way tunnel. Um, so those two structures have been built to an essential safety standard. Um, all other bridges and tunnels are built to a life safety standard. So they are um, built to not collapse and not fall um, in the initial response. Then we move on to our facilities and equipment, including our vessels. Um, our state ferries have terminals and vessels that they immediately need to um, address and uh, assess the damage. So their initial um, response is going to be to assess their infrastructure to start with their ferry terminals and start with the vessels. Then they will offload any personnel or, um, or passengers. And then those vessels will start being utilized under that uh, emergency support function one. So we'll send them where they're needed the most um, to either transport per people or transport goods. Um, and then we also inspect our roadways. As Patty mentioned, sometimes we get roadway damage due to earthquakes. There's buckling, um, there's landslides, there's signal issues. So we do also uh, continually assess our roadways. And then if an aftershock happens, we do it again. Um, so these damage assessments can last for months sometimes um, after earthquake happens. Um, and moving into restoration, Patty did also mention lifeline routes. 
The lifeline routes that Washington State Department of Transportation has is a much larger um, outlook. And what our goal is, is to connect our um, federal distribution points. So those distribution points are start up in Everett at Payne Field. They move south down to uh, I-405, south on I-405 down through Seattle, connecting back down to um, back down to Joint Base Lewis McCord. So it does skip through the downtown Seattle corridor. As I think everybody knows, the downtown Seattle corridor has hundreds of bridges. Um, many of them are hollow core columns. So we are not expected. There's no way to um, retrofit hollow core column bridges at this point. There's no um, cost effective way uh, to do it. So we do not anticipate being able to utilize I-5 through the downtown Seattle corridor. Um, our entryway into I-5 is going to be the floating bridge and is also going to be SR-99. Um, after the I-5 corridor and 405 corridor, we also connect I-90 over to uh, Moses Lake. So those are your three federal distribution points, Painfield, JBLM, and Moses Lake. What our goal is, is to connect to those three points so we can start to move goods, goods and equipment to uh, the local communities that need it. Then the goal from there is to connect other lifeline routes like the city of Seattle, um, King County's lifeline routes, to WashDOT's lifeline routes. So in theory, we will have this large connected system that is retrofitted or structured in a way that is easier for us to uh, repair those systems and get them back active quicker. And that is all I have from WashDOT. I will turn it back over to Patty and Kate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kayla. So, um... We will now go to our question and answer portion. I did get some questions in from the um, email. So thank you everybody who did email in. Let me just get this all set up. Great, so the first question we got is gonna be for SDOT and their question is, do you have fuel reserves at your three response locations? So as far as the fuel reserve goes, those three locations actually have other city departments and there as well, and we do have some fuel, but certainly not enough. There's actually a safety hazard with, with storing a lot of fuel, um, and it all comes through a central distribution point. The, the City of Seattle's FAS, our, our uh, division that manages logistics, is in charge of that. So we do have some, but nearly not enough that we would need for response. And I will say that there's also a regional effort, a regional task force on fuel that looks at fuel coming in and decides across the region what the priorities are and will distribute that. So there's definitely a plan in place. I, I didn't want to imply that there wasn't. It just will be a, a, a challenge to get all the fuel we need. And with electricity, again, the city has a huge electric fleet as we move to be a green, clean city, and we do not have a great plan for how we would power those vehicles. Thank you. The next question is also for you, Patty. Do you have food and water, et cetera, for support staff? Do you have sleeping arrangements for them? So we do have MREs. Those are meals ready to eat and water at not only all of our field locations, but also every floor downtown and the Bank of America building and the Seattle Municipal Tower um, does have those on hand. But we strongly encourage, just like I asked you all to be prepared for two weeks, that our employees are prepared and their families are prepared because people are not going to respond if they are worried about their families. So logistically, no, we do not have a ton of supplies and that's part of any incident response is bringing in those resources that would come in. And what it would look like, much like uh, a wildfire or the recent hurricanes as New Orleans, is the city would collectively come up with places for all city staff to eat, shower and be fed. And we would look at that holistically in established camps, if you will, for all city employees. Great. So the next question might be for both Kayla and Patty. And I think we touched on it a bit, but are there ratings for bridges um, in Seattle being earthquake ready? Yeah, I'm going to defer to Kit. <laughs> Thank you, Kit, for being here, who's one of our bridge engineers, to answer that. Hello, everyone. 
So we do not have a, a rating per se, uh, but we, we do have a bridge seismic program that we are systematically going through and looking at a lot of our older structures that was built at a uh, code compliance that was uh, not considered the modern uh, seismic code compliance. Um, so we are uh, looking at those and building those bridges to a standard similar to WASHDOT is doing, which is life safety, which is basically uh, allowing that uh, the bridge won't collapse to create fatalities. I, I would also add uh, to that. So last summer, City Council asked SDOT to do a pretty extensive report on all of the bridges after the West Seattle Bridge was closed. And so that gave us a more holistic view of, of what our bridges looked like. And I would also say too that all of our seismic retrofit comes out of levees. And so Seattle has been very generous in passing transportation levees. So we retrofit as many things as we can based on levy dollars. So I wanna say thank you for the community for supporting those levies. Thank you. Um, the next question is for both SDOT and WASHDOT. Could you comment more specifically on how SDOT will work with WASHDOT um, for say like the Aurora Bridge and the Army Corps of Engineers? Um, how do they work together and who has authority over the Fremont Bridge, SDOT or WASHDOT? Kit, would you just talk about the Fremont Bridge first and then Kayla and I can answer the rest of the question? Yes, that shouldn't be a problem. So the Fremont Bridge is a city of Seattle responsibility and SDOT is responsible for that bridge. And from Kate, or sorry, Kayla, do you want to comment from the, the WASHDOT's perspective and then I'll put us all together? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so first off, we coordinate ahead of any sort of incident um, to begin with. So we start with the planning process um, and we move forward from there. So Patty and I or our agencies are in contact with each other on a very regular basis, um, starting before any sort of emergency happens, um, making sure even just our contact lists are up to date. Um, so the planning process starts now. And then once an emergency occurs, we all already know each other we're familiar with our agencies and how each other works. Um, the immediate response always starts in the field. So uh, City of Seattle, their Transportation Coordination Center, and uh, Washington State Department of Transportation's Traffic Management Center would actually be the first to receive those phone calls. They immediately would start coordinating with each other um, between those call centers, I guess is what you could call them, dispatch centers or call centers, um, they would immediately start coordinating with each other. Once something bigger happens, um, a larger response happens that requires the coordination of emergency operations centers or activation of emergency operations centers, somebody like Patty or I would step in, activate our EOCs. We would either send representatives to each other's EOCs um, or we would constantly communicate either via Teams or conference calls to ensure that everybody um, is in the same in the same uh, picture that we're all uh, situationally aware of what's going on. Patty, do you have anything to add? Yeah, and so I mentioned this National Cascadia exercise coming up uh, in 2022. That is the whole point of it, that exercise is for um, from my from for my agency is to coordinate with WashDOT, so we are doing that ahead of time. We coordinate all the time on a, on a regular basis. If you think about any big accident on I-5, that has an impact to the city street system, and so in the, on a regular day we work together. Um, and then certainly in snow response, if you think about the last couple of years, we've had more snow than we've ever had, and we, then the next year we have more. And so we always work closely with WashDOT. They are very, very generous. They loan us snow plows, especially on on and off ramps that access their facilities. So um, we have a very close partnership and um, continue to practice that on a daily basis. The last part of the question was about the Coast Guard. We also coordinate closely with the Coast Guard on a daily basis on openings and closures of our movable bridges including things like uh, we created an agency, interagency wide emergency response plan when we first closed the West Seattle Bridge that the Coast Guard was highly involved in to make sure that not only were we meeting the regulations and requirements, but they wanted to let us know, hey, we have all of these resources. If you need them, how do we help? 
So we have a very good working relationship with the Coast Guard and our bridge operators talk to the Coast Guard on a daily basis, I believe. Is that right, Kent? That's correct. If there's any incident that comes through that basically um, creates a problem for the uh, the navigable channel or uh, mariners, uh, we do correspond with the Coast Guard. Yes, and also from a washout perspective, just to add on to that, um, the Coast Guard is the regulatory agency for waterways and marine highways. And so Washington State Ferries is constantly in contact with the Coast Guard. They are a regulating agency for Washington State Ferries. And they will, the captains for uh, the State Ferries, will take direction from the Coast Guard um, when they are directed to. Great, thank you. So the next question is, if the ballad, ballard locks are crumbled and or breached, then what would happen? And is there a map of estimated areas that would be flooded in such a scenario? That is a good question. Um, one that I don't think any of us can answer adequately um, on this phone call. It might be a follow up since the infrastructure of the locks is actually not something that the city or the state manages that would be the core of engineers definitely a good question and i am interested to see what they have to say on that um, as well so we will have to take that question and research it and then uh, share it out i do have a contact email for that person so we'll circle back with you um, and then the final question that we have is what advice do you have for people trying to walk back to their home within the city of seattle including crossing the ship canal I, that That is a tricky question. So the first thing I would say in right after an earthquake, people's um, inclination is to run outside right away. And that's sometimes the worst thing to do because then you're susceptible, depending on what kind of a building you're in, you can see kid is in our tower. He would need to stay in our tower. If you run outside, um, then you're susceptible to debris that, that would be falling. And so it's, it kind of is situational to where you are. I would say the most important thing to tell people about planning to walk home is make sure at your workplace, wherever you are, that you have a good pair of shoes. I mean, closed toed, like lace up, that is the most important thing is protecting your feet and also having an, an appropriate jacket, not a black one. If you think about lights being out and earthquake at night, but something that people can see that would also provide some coverage are the two most important things that I think people can have. And then I would also just try and, and listen to, depending on what facility you are in, there might be a property manager that would give more specific directions. Um, but wherever you go, if you do come out of your facility, you don't want to walk down streets that have those old buildings that I talked about, right? You would want to go and, and try and congregate in an open space, whether it's a street level parking lot that is not going to be impacted by a building collapse, um, so it's very situational. The most important thing is those good shoes to have and also appropriate outerwear that's not black so people can see you. So Patty, could I make one comment as well too? Is that Please. people should, so I was gonna say was that um, people should listen to their first responders as well too in law enforcement because there are gonna be um, dangerous situations, uh, crumbling buildings and other things that people are not aware of in that the first responders will have some more uh, intimate knowledge of. Absolutely, thanks, Kit. Um, so yeah, I would like to add a quick comment as well, since you mentioned the ship canal. Um, getting across the ship canal is not going to be ideal in a major earthquake situation. Um, our recommendation is probably not to try, um, especially immediately after an earthquake. Everybody is going to be going everywhere. You're very quickly going to get gridlocked into traffic. Um, so our recommendation is have a plan for wherever you're going to go. If you're in the city of Seattle, you're there for work um, and you don't live in the city of Seattle or vice versa. Have a plan for what you're going to do at work. Have a plan for what you're going to do at home, um, at your parents' house or etc. Um, but the ship canal is likely not going to be a uh, wonderful uh, path for transportation following a major earthquake. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, so we do have one last question. I will actually handle this one. So it's how does communication take place if communication lines and cell connections are expected to be down? That's a great question. Um, in a major catastrophic earthquake, that is a good expectation to have and one that you should plan for. And so what we encourage you to do is, first of all, have a plan and like Kayla said, know what you're going to do so that you aren't quite as reliant on that immediate communication. So if you're at work and you know where you need to get to to meet up with your family, um, sometimes cell phones will work in terms of uh, text messages more than phones, especially after a major um, disaster if the systems are overloaded. So um, remember that SMS texts work better than phones um, and they clog up the data lines much less. So we recommend having an out of state contact, somebody you can text from, you know, well outside the earthquake impact area to say, hey, Aunt June, I'm OK. Please let anyone else know who contacts you know that I'm OK. And the whole family should agree on that person and who they're going to get in contact with. Um, you can also do things like um, have satellite radios um, or, you know, you can get your ham radio um, operator. But it's a fair assumption that immediately after an earthquake, communication is going to be very difficult. And we encourage you to have plans um, that account for that. Can I add to that, Kate? Yes, definitely. And, uh, two, two things. Kate mentioned ham radio. So the city has a robust group of volunteers that are amazing, that are ham operators, that uh, train and practice with us, our auxiliary communication system. They will automatically deploy to places across the city and are able to not only deliver messages to help response, but they can also actually act like a wireless uh, conduit and send pictures and data just much like you would with a regular connection. The last thing about that is um, the communications being down is a pretty common phenomenon in any major thing, whether it's a wildfire that occurs. And so the government and also our private sector partners have these mobile units. They're, they're sometimes they're cows or cats is what they call them, that they deploy pretty quickly. They're staged across the country where they can come in and immediately boost uh, cell tone, pardon me, cell service. We won't get that right away, but um, our our private sector partners and the government is is has that as part of their plans, and we'll deploy those pretty quickly. Great, and that actually concludes our questions. So, if anybody else has anything that they'd like to add, um, any presenters, please let me know. But otherwise, thank you all so much for attending. Um, anything else from the presenters before we sign off? No, I just uh, appreciate um, everyone that came tonight and I hope if you thought it was interesting and learned something that you will share this video out with friends and family members and coworkers so that we can get the message out broader. And that is a great segue into the, um, we will be sending this video out via email early next week. Um, if you did register for this session or the previous session we had to reschedule from, you will get an email with a link to this. It'll be uploaded to YouTube along with all of the previous webinars. So you can watch this one and the previous instances, instances as well. Uh, the slides will be sent out alongside of that. So if you had any questions about the slides specifically, um, you can ask those. And again, if you do have any follow-up questions, please don't hesitate to email us at oem at seattle.gov. And if OEM can handle that question, we will get it answered. If we need to farm it out to SDOT or WASHDOT, we'll get you connected with the right folks over there to get your question answered. So thank you so much, everyone. Have a great evening, and um, we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar.